Cage. Hello, I'm David from The Wedding Present. Welcome to Chain Reaction. And I'm uh, joined with Radio 1 presenter, John Peel. <laughs> it makes it sound as though we're having some kind of uh, physical relationship. <laughs> I'll probably start from the most obvious beginning point, which is uh, how did you actually start? So what actually sort of made you start broadcasting on the radio? Well, I'd like to, I mean, I would like to have been a journalist, and I'd, I would like to, I'd like doing pieces for the papers now, you know, mm. and, but... As far as the broadcasting went, it was just something that I always wanted to do. I mean, from yeah. a very early age, from sort of 10, 11, 12 years old, when I used to be given records. And, of course, in those days, you were just... I'd, people would say to me, what do you want for Christmas or what do you want for your birthday? And I'd say, records. And it didn't matter what record, just any record at all would do. And because we lived in the country, and uh, you couldn't get around very easily because petrol was rationed and so on, I sort of built up this yearning to be able to play these records that I liked for other people. I know this sounds possibly corny, but it's true. And yeah. I thought... You know what the ideal job would be, uh, having listened to Radio Luxembourg and to the American Forces Network, where they had DJs, and I thought, well, that's the ideal job for me, just somewhere where I can go and play records that I like on the radio and hope that other people will like them too. And although that looks like the kind of thing that uh, you put in the worst and most, uh, <laughs> you know, corny Hollywood uh, biography, it's actually true. Are well, there any disadvantages then to the job, you think? Um, well, interestingly enough, I think one of the disadvantages is... Uh, so for me, anyway, is something which I rather suspect I share with you, because I've, I've always been much impressed by the fact that uh, at your gigs, because it's something which is obviously liable to be much misunderstood, that, that at your gigs you go and stand outside as people come in and talk to the people who come in to see you, and then after the band have played, you go out and do the same thing. And I yeah. suspect, <laughs> I mean, and, and this is the kind of thing that obviously can get you kind of pilloried by the music yes. papers, but I suspect, and I've not discussed this with you beforehand, but I suspect that it's probably something to do with the fact that you uh, regret the kind of distancing that occurs between you and your audience because of how other people perceive you, if yeah. that's not too complicated. Uh, well, it's actually fashionable now. I mean, I mean, nowadays it's almost like uh, appropriate to have this barrier between, you know, people who are in groups are suddenly hoisted to this, you know, superhuman, you know, I'm a pop star level, and, uh, and the rest of the audience. And of course, when I first got interested in music, which was probably, you know, the late 70s, it was, you know, bands were actually trying to break that down. They were saying, but we're not actually different from you, we're actually the same people. Anybody could do this. And that, that I think, really inspired me to actually you know, start a group in many ways. So. Well, I think uh, it's an aspect of it that always distresses me. I mean, obviously, I don't get it on the same scale, just being a DJ, but uh, I think... DJs, or Radio 1 in particular, certainly started out from the perspective that DJs were really rather special and wonderful human beings and should be treated as such, because yeah. in the early years, um, you know, they, they really built the station around the myth of the, mm. the DJ. It's nice when people come up to you, as it must be to you, when they come up and, as they, as they often do, and approach you as a kind of equal and just talk about what you do and uh, the aspects of it that they like or don't like. But, I mean, I've occasionally had people come up to me at, at things and, and because of the, their perception of what my job is and perhaps even my perception, their perception of why I do it, sometimes they become, like, shaking with fear and that seems to me to be incredibly sad because, you know, that, if, if that's the case, then they've in, entirely missed the whole point. I think I was probably shaking with fear, with fear the first time I met you. Well, I was, I was trying to remember, funnily enough, I was trying to remember where that was. It was in Leeds, presumably, but I can't... Can you remember uh, the No, exact? I think it was actually outside this very building. Cause was I, it, I brought yeah? a demo tape down and... The Lost uh, Pandas. And we saw you enter the building, we thought, that's him, that's him, and we, th and we were just too scared, so we left it around the corner. <laughs> but then, but then uh, <laughs> a couple of hours later, we sort of regained our composure and said, uh, excuse me, Mr Peel, would you like to listen to our demo tape? And, uh, that's right, because I always felt very bad. I've still got those demo tapes, incidentally. Yes, if there's I know, any, but, I, I you always remind me every time I meet you. And, uh, and if there's any bootleggers out there who'd be interested in coming to some sort of an arrangement. I'm glad I destroyed all mine, of course. And they're, they're probably the only ones in existence. Now. Is that right? Have you really destroyed them? Well, well I don't think they were very good in, in retrospect. You know, at the time, I thought they were brilliant. But uh, I think oh, we'll be, uh, well, that's strange, because I mean, I'd have thought that you'd have wished to um, 
Re like having sort of photographs of yourself as a child. I mean, it's just nice to have retained them. So, that, I mean, embarrassing, but uh, yeah. perhaps were quite nice. I don't think they were that. I probably wits all the embarrassing photographs out of my photo album. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that implies some uh, deep rooted neurosis. Obsession, yeah. you know, they're raising the past. So. I'm going to have a bite of my cheese sandwich now, David, okay. so you're going to have to talk a bit. You mentioned your family there, and obviously uh, <clears throat> I've met them all now, and uh, it seems a very close family, which, uh, from what I can gather, is probably slightly different from your own upbringing. Um, yeah, so, well, that's that's true, actually, yeah. Um, didn't have a bite of my cheese sandwich, after all. Question's um, too short. Mm, question's <laughs> too short. Well, I would like it to be. I mean, obviously, I have rows with them, uh, you know, about all of the traditional things, like untidy bedrooms. I can't but, imagine you walk into their bedroom and turn, the, turn, turn their music down. That's probably no, the that around, isn't it? Well, it, it did happen to me once, yes. Uh, I mean, many years ago, the two oldest, William, who's now 16, and Alexandra, who's 14, did come sort of hand in hand when they were about <laughs> eight and six and say, Dad, do you mind turning the records down because we can't hear the television? <laughs> and I thought, hold on a second, this is this kind of role reversal. I was supposed to do that. Mm. But... Um, I don't want them to be like me, uh, particularly, and I, I don't necessarily want them to be doctors or lawyers, unless they themselves mm. wish to be doctors or lawyers, but uh, I would like them to find, as I did, something that they genuinely enjoy doing <coughs> and are happy with and can actually earn a living doing. That would be ideal. And I'd like them to go to university, not even to acquire the necessary qualifications, because those seem to be less important these days than they were of yore. When, uh, you know, if you had a degree, it, it sort of virtually guaranteed you a job, even if you were actually yeah. incredibly stupid as a human being, barely functioned socially, you could still get a job. I don't think that applies so much now. Um, but I'd like them to go to university for the social experience, because I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about having been too dumb to go to university myself. Well, well my own childhood was, through no fault of my parents, my mum died uh, this summer in July. And uh, uh, something which actually, uh, you know, I was, uh, I miss her terribly, as, a, uh, and I'm sort of glad that I do because at one time I wouldn't have done because my relationship with my parents was never terribly close. But in the last two or three years of her life, uh, my mum and I got on a lot better than we ever had done previously because she was rather prone to saying things like, because <laughs> um, she was. Uh, a fairly avid drinker, and uh, she's rather prone to saying things at parties, wait for a pause in the, si uh, in the conversation and a bit of a silence, and she'd say, uh, I have two brothers, Alan and Francis, and on one notable occasion she said, Alan was always my favourite son, and then Francis, and then she sort of fixed me with this steely gaze and said, and then you. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, but in uh, her last few years it wasn't like that at all. How do you think you're perceived by people? Because I... I was reading uh, an interview with, I think it was Andy Kershaw actually, who said that you were, you thought you were like a like a dotty old eccentric who enjoyed <laughs> playing uh, unlistable records, which I I, I think is completely untrue. I mean, I, 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 well, that's, I, that's, I mean, that's, of course, the trouble is when you you know when you as you know yourself has obviously been a victim of it on numerous occasions. Mm. Uh, when when things are written down that you said, you can't convey in on the no. page the kind of intonation or your, your facial expression when you were saying. But it makes um, it sound like you're actually, you know, what you do is quite affected, like you actually play records. No, not which, at all. Which I mean, are unlistable, which obviously, I mean, I, I think it's not the case, but. No, so. it, it certainly isn't. I mean, there, there are, I mean, I, obviously, there are times when, uh, you know, there are, you, you kind of put records into the program because uh, they have. Um, I mean, I played a record last night, a 15 second long track by Intense Degree, which has got like a really long title, and it's from a 7 inch EP. Uh, which has got uh, 69 tracks by 52 bands on it, mm. and they're all incredibly abrupt. And, and of course, you, you, it's difficult to say, well, you know, you're playing this because of its high musical worth, but at the same time, I kind of like it as, you know, I just like the idea of it. Well, and but in that case, I think it's, it's probably valued as a pop icon. Uh, entirely it's a pop so. artifact anyway, isn't De it? Yes, definitely yeah. so, yes. Mm. And I certainly wouldn't... Uh, I mean, I quite often, you know, when I'm, when I'm picking a track to play from an LP, I'll, I'll pick one that's got a, a kind of title that amuses me. There was... Uh, um, one I played last night was something about a hummingbird locked in a block of ice or something from uh, a new LP by Thinking, uh, what's it called, Thinking, Thinking Fellas Thinking. Union Local 282. And, uh, you know, I shall play other tracks from it, but that's the one that I played first because I like the title as well. Mm. So, I mean, it's one of those things where there's always been in the past, not so much now, thank goodness, but in the past, uh, particularly in the 1970s, you know, rock music or progressive rock or whatever it was we were calling it at the time, was perce perceived as a kind of A-level subject, you know, something to be taken really rather seriously. And uh, I think, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is supposed to be, I hesitate to use the word fun, because that's always been mis so much misused in the context of Radio 1 in particular. But 
you're supposed to enjoy it as well, and sometimes <laughs> even find aspects of it funny. You, know? you do stand out as like a radio on DJ with uh, a certain set of views which which don't really fit in with, you know, maybe some of your colleagues. Do you fit in with the other sort of radio on DJs? Well, um, there have been some that I, you know, that I knew and liked. I mean, people like Kid Jensen was obviously like a, a, a good pal. I mean, I was really fond of him, and then uh, Andy Kershaw. And uh, over the years, there have been quite a few, even people that I thought I disliked, like Tony Blackburn, once I got to know him a bit, realised that in a peculiar way we felt the same things, although we were approaching them from diametrically opposed positions. Yeah. Of course, you've been here <laughs> all the time that the Radio Ones existed, so... Yes, the old, the old, uh, <laughs> the old inha oldest inhabitant. Yes, well, I think... I mean, so I'm a great, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a great sort of believer, in a way, in setting your sights low. You know, I, I, I feel sometimes rather guilty in these kind of thrusting and ambitious times, but uh, all of the things that I really wanted from life, uh, apart from playing for Liverpool, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd done or had got by the time I was about 30, you know, because I'd, I'd met Sheila, who is, you know, who you know, and uh, I always feel that people ought to be interviewing her rather than me, because she's very much uh, the fuel on which I run. But then, uh, uh, having met her and having bought her house in the country, you know, because I'm a country boy by and large, and having got four amusing and, you know, most of the time, generous-hearted children, and a job on the radio, uh, and a couple of dogs, and a few cats and things, I really actually don't want for anything else, and I sometimes feel quite guilty, as though, uh, because you're all supposed to want, for example, to get onto television, but I've done mm. bits of television, and I've always been frankly always been crap on there because I'm always really nervous whenever I see a camera pointing at me I get all jumpy and ill at ease and what people used to say when I used to do Top of the Pops on a regular basis with Kid Jensen people used to say oh, God you looked so cool and relaxed on there and of course the reason I looked cool and relaxed was because I was actually frozen to the spot with terror because as soon as the light came on on top of the camera I just I was immobilized you know like a, yeah. a rabbit caught in a car's headlights and what they mistook for cool was uh, uh, anxiety uh, and terror and when I found out that I didn't actually have to do television if I didn't want to, um, it was a great it was a great relief to me. I mean, there are silly things I like. I'd like to have a very fast and dangerous car and things like mm. that. But uh, uh, that's just silliness, really. Are you fairly uh, obsessive about the program? Do you think? I mean, I mean, is it like? A, I think you... I couldn't do it any other way, frankly. Mm. I, I, um, because of just the sheer volume of stuff that comes in for the program, you know, records and yeah. uh, tapes, demo tapes, and but also another th aspect of it is uh, the mail that you get, and I'm sure this is the same for you. The letters that you get are not of the kind of letters that are going to be satisfied with an autographed picture. Right. In fact, if you send an autographed picture, they'd send it back and say, <laughs> what the hell have you sent me this for, yes. you twerp? You know, what I wanted to know is about that record you played after the long reggae record on the 17th of November in 1978, <laughs> you know. That kind of stuff, and and uh, most of the letters that I get, are, they're, they're the kind of people, you know, that you think, actually, I'd really, I wish they lived in our village. I can never understand why they don't, you know. I mean, mm. uh, statistically speaking, there must be somebody in our village who listens to the programme, but I've not found yeah. out who it is. But most of the letters you get are genuinely nice letters, and people kind of open up to you in perhaps a way that they wouldn't do to, to other people. And when... Um, uh, Tony Parsons and Julie Birchall wrote their book about uh, punk uh, and I was expecting a terrible slagging and about the only things they could find to say unpleasant about me were the fact that I was old, which I was even then and that I was like a social worker and I was quite proud of that actually I, I was, certainly wasn't offended by it, you know I think uh, being a social worker is uh, quite a worthwhile thing to be much maligned but w well worth doing and I, I don't see myself as a social worker, but if that's how they saw me, then I'm quite happy with that. Well, I think the reason why I actually met you for the first time in person is because I was aware that you do get a lot of demo tapes sent through the post, and I wanted mine to be a bit special, so I thought if I wait outside Radio 1 and then creep up to you and shove it into your hand, you'd probably take more notice. But how many demo tapes would you actually receive in an average week, then? Well, I suppose, uh, it's, you know, fluctuates, but I suppose 50, 60, 70, something like that. I mean. Because they come in from... Uh, you can't possibly listen to them all, though, presumably. I do in the fullness of time. As, what, what tends to happen is because... Um, obviously, you know, listening to records and putting together radio programmes is not, uh, for me, something that you can delegate in any way. No. Um, and a record takes as long as it takes. I always say rather cleverly, actually, uh, you can neither accelerate nor delegate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they like that sort of thing in I marketing. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, have it tattooed <laughs> on the back of your hand. And... Um, so uh, I spend um, most, well, an average week goes like this. I mean, I, I come home 
from town on Sunday afternoon, uh, having had two nights in a row when I don't get to uh, bed until about three o'clock. So I'm fairly knackered. I used to go and have breakfast at Andy Kershaw's girlfriend's restaurant in uh, uh, Crouch End, and then I go home and uh, unpack all of my bags and file away the records in as far you know as far as I can do because things are such a mess now because I've run out of space. Um, listen to one or two records while I'm doing it, and then usually go and fall asleep in front of the fire and, you know, just sit around. I mean, it's not one of those things where when you get home, it's not like Disney where all the children come rushing out, uh-oh, Daddy's home, you know, and they, I mean, it's like you walk in there, it's like, hush, Dad, you know, it's not even like, hey, Dad's home, or hello, Dad, or anything like that. <laughs> Shut up, we're watching something on television, you know. But that's how it should be, really. I mean, I think it's important if you, you know, for a father just to kind of be there, really, rather than not doing that thing of where you're trying to relate to them all the time. Because I think they get a bit fed up with that, frankly. And, <laughs> you know, you always they see, like Americans when they're interviewed, it's always that stuff about, uh, hey, listen, me and my boy, are, we're best friends. And you think he doesn't need a best friend; he needs a dad. His best friend will come from somewhere else. He'll choose his best friend. But you're his dad, and he can't choose a dad. So just be dad-like. So I just kind of hang around, and then when they go off to school on Monday morning, uh, I start listening to records, and I start usually about half past seven, and uh, I stay in my room working. Uh, I mean, it's not, you know, I like doing it. I mean, it's not drudgery at all. Sometimes it is, you know, but I mean, if you're really tired. or you, But uh, I'll usually work until about 9.30, half past nine. I usually go and watch... Uh, either the nine o'clock news or uh, the rather inferior ten o'clock news. Um, but I, I work through the day and yeah. occasionally, like, uh, I occasionally go out and have a couple of games of tennis uh, during the week or uh, about once a week I go to the pub in the village of Rattlesden for lunch. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time I'm working because How do you decide which records to actually play then? I mean, do you have like a system for a... Well, people, a, people always assume that there's some kind of uh, template, you know, that's right, it's something, it's a, 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 a chart that you can yeah. tick off saying, so this has out of tune guitars, that's plus one, <laughs> <you know? laughs> singer who can't sing, plus two, uh, that sort of stuff. But it's really not like that at all. It's it's just uh, an instinctive thing, you know, you put, you put... Really, it just boils down to when I'm playing them, I think, I'd like to hear this coming out of the radio, and other people might do as well. And I always use the same story, so uh, uh, it may not be unfamiliar to some people, but I was driving back once from New Orleans, and it was about three o'clock in the morning, and I was in the car on my own, and I'd left my two friends down uh, in New Orleans, because in those days, before we knew about sexism, we used to follow the fortunes of a young woman who was called Chris Colt, the girl with the 45s, and we used to follow her around from strip joint to strip joint. And I was driving back, I say three o'clock in the morning, moonlit night, driving through the piney woods of East Texas, and dead straight road, just rising and falling through the woods. And every once in a while, you came across a little wide place in the road, which would be a small town or village, really, but they don't call them villages. And uh, as I came up over the top of one one hill, and it was like the moon is right at the other end of the road, so you've got this kind of silver ribbon of concrete in front of you. And uh, Elmore James, Stranger Blues came on, which starts off, I'm a stranger here, I just drove in your town. And as I came down, I was whizzing through this little town. And it's just the perfect record in the perfect context. And I've never forgotten the setting. And I love the idea of perhaps just once in every programme, once in every month, being able to imprint something that firmly on somebody else's uh, memory, you know. Yeah. And uh, so when I'm listening, I'm not saying that every record is going to have that effect. Uh, on any one person, or yeah. but that's, that's what I'm looking for anyway. Yes, in practice, yeah, to drive terms. around uh, right. sexism. Yeah. Do you think there is like a typical appeal listener then? Well, I know that there isn't. Um, you know, it, it always used to be, uh, or people have said in the past that they saw students, but that simply isn't the case. Uh, and uh, students seem to listen mainly to Simply Red and things like that mm. uh, for their pains, as though being a student wasn't difficult enough. And uh, then uh, a former. Uh, a management person within Radio 1, I'd better not be more specific than that, but uh, long since retired, um, once memorably said in a meeting that I wasn't at and shouldn't have heard about, but did, that uh, with my programmes, when somebody ex suggested extending them, he said, I think we've done enough for the unemployed now, uh, which to me is an absolutely shocking thing to say. Yeah. Um, but no, from my own experience, uh, you know, the the audience for the programme is drawn from all sorts mm. and conditions of people, and I hope that it always is. And I'd sooner work for a relatively small number of people who actually listen to it uh, than to have a sort of mass audience who just have it on in the background. Oh, yeah. I, that would be, I find that very difficult. If I Speaking of the management of, uh, of, of Radio 1, I suppose, BBC, do you think you've uh, have maybe s sort of sustained your uh, career here because in some ways you're actually... You know, like a true Rethian sort of presenter, you know. In, in well, 
I'd like to think so. I mean, obviously, if Lord Reith wasn't uh, already dead, he'd die if he heard one of my programmes. But I think, in a, I mean, I wouldn't be able to articulate it very well, but I think that there is a kind of Reithian mm. principle behind it. But it is one of those things people always say, oh, well, of course, you would say that anyway, because you work for the BBC, so you've got to keep in good with them. But I've had my rows with them over the years, God knows. But the, the great strength uh, about the BBC, and I really don't think that there are very many other places anywhere on earth where I should have, uh, where this would, of which this would be true, but in all of the time that I've been doing... Uh, the, these programs, and as you said, it's since the start of Radio 1 in 1967. Nobody on the management side has ever, I mean, ever once uh, tried to interfere in the content of the program, and that's the great strength of it. Once they accept that you know what you're doing, that there are people who like it, they do just leave you alone to get on with it. Mm. And how would you, st I mean, see the future, I suppose, I mean, even sort of, I suppose, like following on from that, you know, with, with the current problems that the BBC faces and... You know, well, I think people genuinely don't know what's going to happen, you know. Mm. I, I think obviously there is a great deal of uncertainty and uh, unease, and uh, all you can do is just... What I always think I've done is play the kind of Geoffrey Boycott innings, you know, <laughs> just pushing the ball back down the wicket and getting on with it and <clears throat> watching the uh, runs clicking up on the scoreboard. And... Uh, Really, I'm quite, you know, quite happy to do that. I don't want to get involved in uh, commercial radio, and to be perfectly fair, commercial radio hasn't shown any signs <laughs> of wanting to get involved with me either, because they couldn't allow themselves a luxury of having somebody who goes on the ra radio and plays in any one programme 90% of stuff that's never been played before, you know, because yeah. they, they need to have some more familiarity in the programming than that. So, I mean, I have no ambitions at all. As I say, I used to want to play for Liverpool, but I think I'm probably past that now, although the way the team was playing earlier in know, the season, yeah, I might have got an outing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have got a game. But, um, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm, all I want to do is, as I say, just go on doing what I'm doing now. I'm quite happy to do that, really, until I drop dead. You know, I don't, the idea of retirement doesn't appeal to me very yeah. much. OK, thank you very much, John, and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much, David.